It's a streamer hook. So it's a little bit longer than usual, most. And again, I use pink thread. What size hook, Dennis? Uh, this is, I think it's a size four. Thank you. Uh, it, you could use a size six too, but just you just need enough length to duplicate the one that he gave me, I guess. it's. Uh, I've tried this at the Plexui uh, River, not very successful. But for some reason, the species of pinks run there are larger and a little bit different than the Plexui run. So for a tail on this one, I just use Some greenish crimped material. And not very much, just, uh, you know, it's very sparse, just one strand doubled over a couple of times. So there's maybe about four strands sticking out the back when you're done. And he, he left them about three quarters of an inch, or maybe even an inch long. Very sparse. And for the body, I've got some uh, bright, bright edge cut into strips. Uh, Cutting these strips sometimes is difficult to get them the right thickness, consistent thickness, but I cut, cut a little edge on it to start with. So you just tie the point down. So you line up and just wrap. And with this bright edge, again, remember, it should overlap, but don't, like I used to really pull it tight. Don't pull it tight. You want the edge exposed and overlapped each time. So when I overlap it, give it a little tug at the end of each wrap. I'm not doing a very good job of this. In fact, it's a pretty poor job. I use hackle pliers when I do that. I find it, it helps a lot. Well, I, I like to have the feel of it in my hand so I can feel the tension and so if I use this finger here to hold it down for my next wrap, it works a little bit better for me anyway. But uh, that's as far as far as if I want to go because I want to put the eyes on. Well, these eyes are uh, size small, color gold. Yeah. 
and I just wrap, put a couple of wraps on them. It's quite a ways back from the nose, from the uh, hook eye. I make several wraps, and as you wrap, you can see the eye turning with its tension of the of the line. A couple of figure eights. And the nose, we call the nose, is actually built up to its a, to a taper. Again, because I'm using a thin line, it's going to take a bit here, but get the idea. And just finish off with a couple of half inches. And basically, yours will look a little bit better than mine. <laughs> uh, now, when I put the head cement on, I'll do the whole fly. especially where this eye was tied on. Well, that's what uh, we call the keel. Any questions? Again, keep the tail sparse. Dennis, you don't find any problem with them uh, catching the kelp, do you? Well, I... It's not weedless. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But given the fact that I saw this fly catch so many fish, I'm willing to catch a few pieces of kelp with this. We'll do it later, and both of us will learn something. Thanks, dear. Hey, uh, Dennis, is yeah. uh, is that uh, the name of that fly? Is that the name of a, a creek? It's called the Keel. Now, the Keel River is in fact the Keel, K E O G H or something. K E O G H. It's in back of the Port Hardy Airport. Yeah. Did it did it have a fish hatchery on it at one time? Uh, maybe further up. I'm not too sure. Uh, okay. I've, had, I've had great luck with that fly on the Adam and Eve. I was shown it by Pat George and he, uh, he was killing them with that fly on the river, <clears throat> excuse me, and I used it. And he also introduced me to a gold colored one as well, gold body instead of pink. And that, okay. that sometimes worked. When the pink wasn't working, the gold would work. Okay. Yeah, I do have one of those flies kicking around here somewhere I used at the uh, Adam and Eve. And, uh, but I've only been to the Adam and Eve once. So. Is the gold colored fly also with edge bright? Ron? Sorry, sorry, what was the question? Uh, is was the fly that you use at the Adam and Eve similar to this one uh, it, edge bright also? It uses a gold gold body. It's, it's essentially the same same fly except the gold body instead of instead of the uh, pink laser wrap. And, and it's and it's using that same edge bright uh, type material. No, it sorry, it's using I I used a. Uh, um, a gold, uh, what's it called? I can't remember what it's called. Next next week or the week after, I'll I'll dig out one of those flies and I'll dig out some uh, some of the material and I'll show it show it on the show. Okay, uh, I thank can't you. Put my hand on it right now, but uh, I'll do that for a couple of weeks from now. 
All right, this one is, uh, I think Jim introduced me to this one at one time. And uh, the story with this one is that the guys would be every morning go out to the Buxui River on the beach and they'd wait for the fish to show up at one special spot. Well, this one, and they did this morning after morning, and the fish would arrive right on schedule. This one morning, I'm walking on the beach, and here the guys are sitting in the fog on the log waiting for the fish to show up. And I walk past them, and I keep on going to the mouth of the river. And it was so foggy, nobody was there, but I landed my, I walked into the beach and out in about a foot of water and there were two schools of pinks one on each side of me and I used this fly until I was just worn out I couldn't fish anymore so I'm walking up the beach and here the guys are still sitting on this log waiting for them to show up so anyway I call this my foggy do uh, but one of the other names for it is BMW. So for this one, I use a bead. So I start with a 3 16th bead on a number four. Tungsten, correct? Beg your pardon? Tungsten or weighted bead? No, it doesn't have to be tungsten, just a, just a gold bead. And again, pink thread. Jesus Christ, don't Hey, Barry, what's happening? <laughs> so I got to wrap this to the back and put on a tail. The tail is red. Right. Now, it could be either a red feather or uh, some red wool, anything. I kind of kind of like to use a, a red feather piece of it. Not very much, just a bit. And then I'm going to use this chenille. I've got it on a bobbin right now, but it's pink chenille, short, shiny. And when you're applying this type of chenille, you, you generally brush it back with every wrap to get the bristles to stick up. Now you could stop right there or 
you could add a beard. And sometimes I'll use this deer hair, pink dyed deer hair. Just a small section of beard. Stacker. And it's just a almost to the point where it's touching the, the hook point. Deer hairy does get messy. So that's the foggy do or BMW. Not very neat, not very good, but anyway. Very colorful. And like I say, if if I'm in the fog. For some reason, that bead is just enough to uh, make it visible in the water to the fish in the fog where the sun isn't cutting through. So why do you also call it BMW? I think when Jim told me what it was, he called it the BMW. Hmm. But I tend to nickname my flies <laughs> so that I know what they are and my kids know what they are it's easier to identify. So any questions on that one? Yeah, se several questions. Uh, I, I, I blinked there for a moment and for tail you use marabou, right? Well, it's, it's either a, a dyed red feather or just a piece of red wool. It, it's not okay. really too, too critical. Second question for for the throat uh, is is hair a must or some no? It's a, a lot of my flight, a lot of my BMWs don't even have beards on them. So yeah, no, I was thinking like, can can you could you substitute like um, feather some pink feather stuff like uh, chicken? All the options are open, guys. <laughs> if you if you think one might work, tie a couple with it and try them. And uh, I okay. usually, when I go on the beach, I have my regular fly box loaded and ready to go with my usuals. But I'll also have a small fly box with experimental ones. And some of them are really, really funny looking or whatever, but I just want to try them for fun. So if I'm into fish <clears throat> and being successful with what I've got. Just for the fun, I'll try something different out of that small experimental box. You never know what's gonna work or not. And, uh, yeah. and how important is gold for, I noticed you use gold both for the bead and for your, um, for your dumbbell eyes on the, uh, do you find yeah. gold is an important thing there? From all the flies I've seen on the beach from other guys, they, they're all using gold. I, mm. I, like I have a collection of green and orange and uh, other colors. Again, if you wanna try another color, because 
<clears throat> the eyes of these fish when they're coming in, their eyes are changing, physically changing to seeing blues and greens, which is their prey in the ocean, to reds and oranges, which are breeding colors and egg colors. So their eyes are physically changing. <clears throat> and uh, you can be on the beach fishing Oops. haven't changed yet. They just, just come into the shore. Mm -hmm. But gold seems to work for, for me and for most of everybody else that I've seen out there. Okay. The other little thing I wanted to touch on is uh, weedless flies. And I've been doing some experimenting. The uh, first one I experimented with is this. <clears throat> I'm just using a circle hook with a cone head on it. And I do have a little weight tied behind here, but <clears throat> what I tied on first was a piece of spring steel. And I've been watching various videos. And what I what I did was I took some uh, Don Rigger cable and untwisted it. In the middle of that twisted kinked cable, stainless steel cable, is a piece of straight cable, cable strand. And that's what I used for this particular experiment. It's, it, it looks like it would work, but it's very, very stiff, even, even at this point. So then when I watched a few more videos, oh, this was really a drastic case of weedless. They actually bend the hook. So this part of the hook stays down, but they also add a piece of lead weight right here to keep that part of the down. And the part that's supposed to be weedless is be being protected by the material here. Well, I was bending hooks and getting this bend at the proper angle was a difficult part for me. And I imagine it would work. And I'll even probably try this when I, when I get out there. Then I went to another experiment with monofilament. And on this one, you tie the monofilament on the back, tie your fly, and then when you're finishing off the head, you bring a loop around and tie the loop in. So this, this loop is supposed to protect you from the, from the weeds. Well, again, I'll try this when I'm up there too, experiment with it. But the one I like the most is this one uh, can be tied with or without a bead. And that's the one I'd like to just give a quick demonstration on this morning. Here it is. Okay, here. Is 
can use just about any hook, I guess. Dennis, what, yeah. what test mono is that? Well, what they say is that you should never use fluorocarbon mono because it's too stiff. Then they say that you can go down to 12 pound test or uh, I'm experimenting with 17 pound test just regular mono. And in this one, I'm just gonna start with any hook I can find here and then I put a bead on it. And I tried following their instructions on how to do this particular one. And I tried a few flies and didn't like the way it worked out. So I came up with my own method of same procedure here. So I just cut a piece of monofilament. And I'm going to feed it through the hole. Now this could be a cone or it could be a a bead like I have here. Now, the trick right now is getting this loop to be the right size. So what I found that if I take the loop and tighten it and then bring the loop back, ideally I want this loop to be with my needle here. I want to bring the loop back. Um, can you see that where I'm bringing the loop back to? It's the very back of the hook. That's ideally where I want. I'm putting some pressure on it and tightening the loop. That's where I want the loop to be, right? Measured toward the back of the hook. Can you see that from there? Then, I'm just gonna secure that. At that distance. And so hopefully now I've got that loop at the right length. I'm going to move my bead. I'm going to do a whip finish here. Ah! Sorry, just lost it all. Okay, so now I've got, hopefully I've got the loop at the right length. So when I put my needle there, draw it back, it just comes to the back of the hook. Good. Now, I wanna make that a little more secure. <clears throat> by bringing the wrap up to the front of the eye.
And again, a quick web finish. Then I'm gonna take some, here's a key point, take some super glue or fast drying, quick, uh, whatever glue you wanna use. And I'm just gonna put that right there. And before that dries, I'm gonna put my bead up, right up to the top. And I'm gonna to touch the back a little bit. This glue dries in about two or three minutes. So it's quite fast. Dennis, does the super glue affect the monofilament? Do you know? Uh, well, that's something, I'll, that's a good question. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. But it does hold it in place so that when you're working with it, it's not gonna slip around the hook I guess you could use head cement if you wanted to take the time for it to dry, et cetera. At this point, you could tie your fly, whatever it's going to be. Then once your fly is tied, there's a couple of things you have to do with this loop. Number one, you wanna bring the loop to a point and using these pliers that have slots in them, I can hold the, the front of the loop and I pinch it. Not very tight, just pinch it so it comes to a point. Now, at that point, about one quarter of an inch from, the, from that point, I'm going to bend it up. <clears throat> you see that? Now, theoretically, this should fit right over the, you might have to bend this part here that should fit over your hook. Ah, uh, come on, guy. All right. Again, you have to try and experiment. When I use this, this, this system, okay, so it didn't work right for me to resist time, right? But when I used a system before, I used this is what most of what like I used a circle hook, and this is what it's supposed to look like. Now you can see the bend in here. That's because I used too much material, so the weeds could actually catch on here. So then I fooled around with shortening that length of length. And that, that works on there. So a fish bites, it's, it's on there. Again, you have to experiment and try these things over and over again until you get it right. So it works for you. But I found that th this type of uh, weed free fly works best with a circle hook. So any seaweed coming down is going to be reflected off of here and miss this, this part of the hook. I think, uh, Dennis, the, the circle hook is definitely a better option because it holds the mono in there better. As yeah. A yeah. The yeah. straight, uh, straight points, the, the mono can slip off more easily. Especially if you're using barbless, right? Yeah. And if, 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 if there was a barb on there, it wouldn't be as bad. 
but That's again, fine. you have to experiment like I've been doing. I've got, I've got about seven or eight flies here tied with different methods. And uh, so you got the time, have the fun. <laughs> That's all I know, guys. I got so a the question. Way you, I have a the question. The way you tie this, it looks to me like you could, you could just slip the bead over the mono after you put the mono loop in, right? To save yourself some headaches. Yeah, that's true. You try that? Uh, yeah, I, no, I, I haven't tried that, to be honest with you. I just oh, did okay. it this because the bead was already on a hook. I, again, that's, that's a good idea. I mean, give it a try. Whether it's I have a, a question about the weed guard. Yeah. Do you, do you check the fly uh, between a couple of casts to see if it's in place or? Be honest with you, I've never used weed guards before. This is going to be my first time at it. So oh, whether, okay. it's, whether it's 12 pound mono or 17 pound mono, I, I don't know which is best yet. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's all I got. I have tied. Uh, other flies. Uh, this is one fly I tied with a weed protector. And as you can see, as it turned out, I've got that bend quite a bit and it's down quite a quite a ways. Oh yeah. That would work. And then, and then because I didn't want it that far bending down, I tied another one. With a shorter loop start. And as you can see, the bend isn't so much, so it's not going to be catching weeds here. It's, the bend isn't so much, but this bend in the mono here is a little more extreme. And that's you're going to go have to find a weed bed and go out and dry them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't need well, the fish, you just need the weeds. Here's something you should all be aware of at Klexui is that. At high tide, at the change of tide, there's going to be a lot of debris, sticks, seaweed, bull kelp, everything being picked up off the beach. And as the tide sweeps across the beach, it's going to sweep all this garbage with it. And what I've done in the past is try to cast in between the garbage. So hopefully these weed guards will give me a little more advantage to, to that. And when the tide changes, it, it, this material can be sweeping across the beach, all kinds of garbage and uh, for a good couple of hours. So if you're out there fishing, and you wanna continue fishing, I suggest experimenting with some weed guards. As I've uh, mentioned before, I don't like nylon. Uh, uh, weed guards. Um, I like the bend back a lot. Uh, and one of the reasons why I don't like the mono uh, weed guards is it's a fiddly damn thing uh, to tie. Furthermore, when you're storing them in your box, uh, you can't store them like you can other flies. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. if, and if they're lying on their side, uh, over time, that nylon shifts and it, it, it becomes distorted. And so you, 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 you have to lie them individually in a section. You can't pile one on top of the other because the nylon will deform unless you tie them the morning you're fishing. You know, you'll find that you spend all this time tying those flies and then the day you take them out, God, what happened to them? You know? Would clip boxes work? Um, it, it might, one of the things that, well, if you've got nylon clip boxes, I mean, the old style clip box. No, I mean the Whitley's the, with the metal clips. Yeah, well, they'll rust, uh, you know, with, with salt water. I mean, I've used those, the, the problem with any, a, a metal box, unless it's entirely aluminum, is that you're using salt water flies and, and they will rust. Uh, so uh, there are some interesting nubby style uh, plastic ones 
that you can slip the bend of the hook in. Uh, but, but with those nylon weed guards, when I did use nylon weed guards, I, I made a loop similar to what uh, Dennis has done. Uh, Use the loop only to spread the two arms apart. And then when I glued things into place, I actually cut the loop and cut the, uh, uh, so it was no longer a loop. Uh, so that you just had two arms coming down. And then I would, so, uh, I made an uh, oversized loop and, uh, and cemented it into position. Then I cut back to the length that I felt was appropriate to protect the, the point of the hook. So it was like a double nylon uh, uh, outrigger weed guard. Anyway, those, those are just my thoughts. Yeah, well, I'm, I wanna try this uh, one with the stainless steel. The, uh, I don't know how thick that is or but I want to try this on the souk with the chum and that kaksui too. So, yeah, that'll work. I've, I've never used the uh, the uh, thing out of. I've, I've always used piano wire, uh, which is also stainless steel, uh, far more expensive than the, than the, uh, downrigger uh, uh, cable, which I no longer use. I've got a, a ton of it. Yeah. Well, I just found it by mistake. I was going to use this yeah. these twisted strands, but then I found out in the middle there's a straight piece. So here's a solution to the fly box, I think. These are the um, the Japanese ones, and they come with these streamer inserts, which are basically slits in foam. So if you were to put in, I don't have any weed guards myself. These are pike flies. Yeah, but that will deform the nylon weed guard if you insert it in there. Because you're only inserting, I mean, you're only inserting, so you, you take the, you take your hook and it only goes, the only thing that goes in the slit is this bottom part a little bit. And it just stays there. But what, what, what happens to the nylon weed guard? But it just stays, it stays on, it, it would stay on top. My prediction would be that it yeah. would just stay on top. It pushes it above the point of the hook. And it, yeah. if it stays there for any length of time, it'll, it's going to stay there. It's going to so set yeah. permanently. <laughs> not, not if it's 30 pound mono. <laughs> Trust me, not if it's 30 yeah. pound. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, We've, okay. I've done a lot of those for pike flies and yeah, it, it yeah. It, it makes it difficult to get them in boxes, but if you use 30 pound mono as, as a, a single piece of weed guard, it, it tends to stay where it goes. I, can uh, I just make a comment? Uh, I've, I've been fighting with that same problem for a lot of years. And uh, one of the things that uh, works a bit, but I, I'm not sure it's as effective a fly, is you use a moose mane, uh, as a kind of a throat uh, on it, which extends down to the point of your hook. And you can put it, when you put it in a fly box, it does bend, but it comes back to where it's supposed to be. Anyhow. And, and if, if you have a little collar in behind where the weed guard comes down off the fly, that will also keep the mono from flattening up against the hook. But the collar will give, give it a little bit of a give when the fish bites. Yeah. Does anyone know what they use for weed guards in those big bass flies? Actually, that's where I started. Uh, I went into my bass box and I found some uh, weedless hooks. And I think I've decimated them all in my experimenting, but... Uh, yeah, That's where I started. I've, I've got some of those bass flies that I actually bought, didn't tie myself, but they had nylon weed guards on them. Okay. But it was pretty heavy stuff, like 30 pound test, I think. Yeah. Well, I've tied a lot of uh, bass flies and 
And I finally found a use for a, a monofilament called Mason's hard mono and in 30 pound test. And one of the things I found is that you wrap it uh, down toward the bend of the hook so that the loop stays in position right over the, like in directly over the hook, you have a lot less problems with weed hookup. And, and not only that, but the, the type of mono tends to have a memory. So you want to tie it in so the curve comes up to the hook. And I've used them for years and they work just fine. Okay. For both uh, poppers and sliders. Okay. As well as that, uh, I, I don't know how many of you guys have ever heard of keel hooks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like I have uh, quite a selection in my basement. I ended up with uh, Mrs. Denny when they shut down the fly shop uh, and I got a hold of them. If you guys are interested, uh, I've got quite a sack around here. Uh, we could strike up a deal if you want them. It won't cost you much. <laughs> so what are these hooks, Don? They're called keel hooks. Now, if you, I don't know how long before you're, or you should be off now, but uh, when I'm here next Saturday, I'll, uh, I'll show you what they look like. I have them both in uh, mild steel and stainless. This is the kind of box I was trying to describe. I don't know yeah. if you can see it yeah. properly. Yeah. Okay. It's, it, it's an aluminum box and that's plastic on the inside. And it, those little things are elevated and they've got a slit in them and you can, you can put the, the back of the bend into that okay. little slit. Okay. So this doesn't rust and if I was going to do those nylon uh, weed guards, that's what I would use. And this was made by Perrin, P-E-R-R-I-N-E. Perrin, yeah. So for, for next uh, Saturday, uh, as we said, we're going to get Don to talk about uh, fly tying tools that he has concocted or <laughs> been through over the years. And while, while uh, Dennis was doing his four flies, I tied one <laughs> of what we're going to look at next week, which is the uh, Adams version of the irresistible. It takes a while. Part of, part of the taking a while is trimming the deer hair. <laughs> it, it's kind of meticulous, but it's a very effective fly. So as I hear from somebody who was saying today, it's a good spring fly for... Uh, for the couch in. and they're hard to sink. Like yes, they are. They're very floaty. Mm -hmm. Looks like a Let's candidate for for production tying. You know, <laughs> do a batch of deer bodies and then do the rest. So yeah, can... ex yeah. Except I discovered that I had a lot of time trouble getting these little hackle tip wings. So if you want, want to do away with the wings, you you could do that. I tie the wings on first facing forward mm. and then pick them up later. And that, that keeps them out of the way when I'm doing the deer hair. And it also makes it a lot easier to attach and size the wings properly when you, because if you do it, do it after the deer hair body is sizing the wings and getting them in the right spot is a little tricky. I use a, a duck breast feather rather than wings. Yeah. As um, I often tied them on the shore or something when, when, I got there and didn't have the right fly, and then I started doing it continuously. But for for somebody learning, it's much easier than trying to get those wings perfect. <laughs> They're a little tricky, and but the other one will I might I might uh, if I spend a little more time with it is is to tie it without the the Adam's wing, and this this is just using the deer hair itself as the collar, and that gives it that sort of doesn't have a wing per se, but that, that's a little tricky to spin. So there's a bunch of different options. You can just, you can just do the hackles, right? And forget the wings. So Dennis, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Dennis. Very good. Look forward to seeing everybody there on Tuesday. Yep. If, if I could we, add something to the Klaksui fishing, I, I'm, I have very limited experience there, but, uh, one thing I've noticed, there are a couple of things. When the, when the uh, schools first come in for at least a couple of days, uh, 
blue flies and purple flies work better than pink flies. So if you're going there, have a couple of those colors tied. If you're, if you're later uh, in the season, they don't work. But early uh, new schools, they work better than anything. The other thing I've noticed up there, um, because I have a lot of time not catching fish, and I, I go and ask people that are catching fish what flies they're using. And I've seen um, a really wide range of different flies. The locals have a tendency to use epoxy flies. Uh, they're just, there's really a whole gamut of flies. And I, I think the, the key to getting them work is you need the, the proper sink tip for that day, for that depth. So when you go up, you need a, a, a small selection of, of um, like low or slow sinking tips with you, because that's going to be the key, I think, in most days to match it up properly. Uh, there you go. That's all I can add. I agree with you 100%. Yeah, I had good success with blue flies in uh, the Camel River this year. Really good. Yeah, when the salmon were early. And then pinks. Thanks, guys. Thank Thank you. Guys. See you on Tuesday. Thanks, Dennis. Bye-bye. See you. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Dennis. Bye.